Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Idea Foundation for having me here, Mr. Ram Madhav Shaurya. I want to thank Alok for that very, very complimentary introduction. And I'm always very grateful for such introductions because I'm reminded of an anecdote when I uh, was last introduced. And I think the speaker was trying to, or rather the MC was trying to tell the audience that after my speech, there would be an entertainment program. What he did end up saying was, Mr. Mahindra, after your speech, everything else will be entertaining. <laughs> so uh, that unfortunately did rob my self-confidence right away. And I'm, therefore, I'm extremely grateful when somebody gets it right and is very complimentary. So I, um, let me see, I'm trying to load up here. I thought about what I was going to say today, and we've had ministers here, central and state ministers, we've got bureaucrats, a speaker of the Maldives, Majlis, and I was trying to figure out what I could do which would add any value to all of you. And so what I thought I'd do would be to talk about rabbits. Yes, you heard me right, I'm going to talk about rabbits. Now, um, in English, there is this phrase called frightened as a rabbit. And that implies that a rabbit is an extremely timid creature and one that has no gumption, no courage. But if you look at our own Panchatantra, the rabbit in fact comes out to be a fairly heroic character. And some of you might remember the story about the mighty lion who ruled a jungle, terrorized the, all the creatures in there, and they negotiated a peace with him, saying that every day one animal would be sent up for the lion's nutrition. It came upon the rabbit's turn. This rabbit had no intention of being devoured, thought for a bit, showed up late at the lion's den. The lion was angry and hungry. He said, what happened to you? And he said, well, you know, uh, your highness, I was actually going to come with four other friends. There were five of us to give you a real feast. On the way here, we met another lion who ate up other, the other four, sent me here to tell you that he was the, rule, the real ruler of the jungle. And of course, the lion got really upset. He said, take me to this upstart. The rabbit took him to a well, told him to look inside and said, that's your competitor. The lion roared, jumped into the well, and of course, was done for. So when you look at this story about the rabbit, there are a number of interesting lessons that come out. First of all, the rabbit intended to survive. It had no intention of being devoured. And it knew that its enemy was several times its size, but it leveraged that size, it leveraged that aggression against its opponent. It also saw things that we usually see, but use that information very creatively. And it used the power of its brain, not the power of its brawn, to get ahead. To me, the rabbit, in a sense, is the story of India. If you look at what has brought India to where we are today, we too have been competing against countries and economies several times our size, we have gotten to where we are, not because of our resources. We use very, very frugal resources. We use our innovation and our brains to succeed. And above all, of course, we intend to survive. To me, this ability of doing more with less is India's real advantage. That is our unique strength. Now, I am on Twitter fairly often, and I find it an amazing medium to see how this Indian ability to do more with less is rampant everywhere. One of the good things about social media is that it's been able to show us what our population all around the country can do, leveraging the power of the brain, lowering, lowering all the guards of the competitors, and using very, very frugal resources to win the battle. And I thought I'd share some examples. Now, this is, a, this is a shoemaker in the north 
who put up this, and I was intrigued when I saw this on a WhatsApp forward, and he rebranded himself as Juton Ka Doctor. And I was fascinated by this man, Juton Ka Hospital, as he said. And I actually went, reached out to him. I asked my team to reach out to him, and I asked this man, can I invest in you? And fascinatingly, he said, I don't want anything except a better kiosk to work with. I was delighted that, in fact, our design team, which normally designs our automobiles, created this kiosk for him, which still is an upmarket hospital for him. <laughs> Here's another example. This is a, there was a video clip that came around of somebody obviously had a machine broken down, their excavator, so they just took an old katia and put it attached to that and used the katia to move the, sandal, the, the sand away. So I nicknamed that the katia vator. And then you had this one, the person who hails from Gujarat, who's physically challenged, but uses waste material to build e-bikes. I don't have to explain what this is. Once again, just simple innovative thinking. And this one was fascinating. This was a hydraulic door stopper from an old, from just a water bottle. And the thing cost two rupees, whereas if you wanted to get a normal hydraulic door stopper, it would be about 1,500 rupees. These are student projects. Student projects, one which was about toilets for the visually challenged. The one up there was a solar-powered iron, ironing stand. And then you had an intelligent staircase which would prevent the elderly from falling. And there was a dustbin which, in fact, killed insects. This is a project of a seventh standard dropout who built a digging machine which can dig up ground nuts in an hour which would take a hundred laborers to do. And this one was a trench digging machine, again from a fifth standard dropout. And all of these, by the way, are available on the National Innovation Foundation website. These were part of a program or a competition called Ignite. And this was a trench digging machine that literally liberated a number of laborers from toiling in the blazing sun. This one I borrowed from Dr. Mashelkar, who all of you know, one of our most distinguished scientists. And this one was fascinating. He said that he met some young engineer who said he wanted to invent a toothbrush which would cost one rupee. And Dr. Mashelkar told him, I'm a polymer engineer, there's no way you're going to achieve that. So what this gentleman did was he took bristles, attached it to a piece of Velcro, which you just attach to your finger. And obviously it gets into the, the, most, the deepest recesses of your mouth, and that costs a rupee. He achieved that. So, once again, I just want to say the success portion really for India is, as Mr. N.K. Singh said, the power of innovation. It's innovation which, of course, admittedly is incremental, but it improves the lives of people around us. It's irrepressible. It's available all around the country. So to summarize the good news, innovation is alive. Good news, Mr. Singh, it is alive, and social media has shown us that it's in fact thriving. It needs to be unearthed. It needs to be found. Now, the fact is that we all criticize social media for how it intrudes on our lives, but as I gave you those examples, it's something that has been in fact provoked by social media. People want recognition, and I say that all of us should turn out to be people who are constantly on the lookout for these kinds of inventions. Cost come competence is India's strength. Not just low cost, not just low cost labor, it's also about our intelligence combined with the low-cost approach, which is our strength. And I think we need to leverage Indianness. We need to leverage this capability we have to, to create new innovations at an incredibly frugal cost, which really is our strength. We need to apply that. But there's a big but, which I need to share. And the fact is, this is the index of global innovation, the most recent one. And as we can see, even though China has broken into the top 20, 
we still are fairly low down on the list. So if I'm making this strong case that we have a strong innovation streak in us, then why are we not moving higher on this list? And my view is that Jugaad is just not enough. Now that sounds odd after I've given you so many examples of Jugaad in those photographs that I showed you. I constantly retweet these elements of Jugaad. So I am a believer in that spirit. But it just isn't enough. There is a trap in the Jugaad phenomenon that it makes us complacent. It makes us think that what we are doing is fine. But Jugaad is about making do. It's about compromise. It's about constrained resources. So it's a wonderful skill that we've exercised over time to do more with less. But it does sometimes involve compromises with quality. And it does not lead us to the kind of quantum innovation that India needs to really solve its large-scale problems. So we need to move away from that model. And what I'd like to propose is, and Ornob is here when I first did this. If you remember, we were in a Google Hangout where I talked about this, Ornob. And I said we need to move from Jugaad to Jhakas. Now, I don't know how many of you know the word Jhakas. It's a Mumbaikar phrase. Thank you. I see some Mumbaikars here. It's a phrase that's come from Marathi, but has become street lingo in Mumbai. And if you watch any Bollywood film, I'm sure that you'll... Mumbai street lingo is used. Jakas really means awesome. Unbelievable. That's what Jakas means. So we need to move to that kind of model, if you will. So what is holding us back? And I want to talk about these handcuffs, which I refer to as invisible handcuffs. And I'll enumerate them. There is an incredible embedded risk aversion in all Indians. Ye naak kat jayegi phenomenon. And there are many reasons why one can analyze the reasons for this. Many sociologists among us. Perhaps one of the submissions I would make is that for a country that was poor, as poor as we have been, if you failed, it was a matter sometimes of life and death. Now, when you become an affluent country and you've had a long history of affluence, especially in economies which have a social welfare net, a social security net, then failure simply means that you move to maybe a chapter 11, you lose some money, but you start all over again. And of course, Silicon Valley has made failure something that is an aspirational goal. But in India, there clearly is a hangover about the problems of failure. There's a social stigma about it. That if you fail, then my daughter or son won't be able to get married. I'm glad I hear that's changing, that now people actually are looking for startup characters because they believe those people might in fact become billion dollar owners. So there is a little bit of a change, but I think it's a major hangover. The other one is that we love our comfort zone. It's again a, an offshoot of this fear of failure. And I like to tell this story because I have a very good friend of mine who's a major owner, I mean, a foot, an owner of a major footwear chain. And he came out with this wonderful brand called Mochi, um, which, in fact, is an upscale brand for him. And it's a very good brand, and it's got outstanding footwear that comes. But I asked him, I said, you know, why haven't you gone abroad? Why isn't there a Mochi store on Oxford Street, on any high street in London? What is the real difference between Mochi and Gucci? Nobody really knows what Gucci means. So if you went out to Mo and called yourself Mochi, there's no reason why Mochi should not be the new Gucci. And frankly, his answer was simply, well, I don't know. Um, it's tough, and I'm happy doing what I'm doing. So this is a kind of comfort zone that all of us are prey to. And finally, we don't invest in ourselves. And the example I want to give when I say don't invest in ourselves, I don't even mean, I mean, of course, personally, but I also mean we don't invest in scale. We don't invest in the kind of uh, capacity that we need, the kind of advertising we need. And the big, best example of that really is the Simputer. This was a device invented in 2002. 
and it was a handheld computer available for 10,000 rupees. The inventors wanted it to revolutionize rural India. It had remarkable inventions on it. It had an accelerometer, which was incorporated in the iPhone later on. It involved, you could use, you could write on the screen and swipe features that came in on the iPhone later. And it's one of the best known failures of India. And the reason was because, one, of course, they, they were not able to invest in scale. They didn't find the resources to do it. The government kept promising orders, but never gave them the orders that were required to give them the scale. But think about it. If this had succeeded, where would India be today on the map when it came to smart devices? So you may ask me, so what have you done? You've been talking. What about the risks you took? I'm going back to the same time, 2002. I remember when we were just making vehicles that didn't even have hard tops. And we were involved in doing an incremental project, which was going to make a long utility vehicle that could, sail, that could seat 13 people. When I got a call from my R&D guys saying, can you come over, we want to show you something. And they said, you know, we are doing that other project, but this is what we really want to do. And they showed me a design, a 3D design of the Scorpio. They said, we think this is what India really means. So I said, well, that's not the project you told me you're doing. This is really the future of Mahindra. How much is it going to cost? And I almost had a heart attack there when they said 600 crores back in 2002 or $120 million, which was more than we had ever spent on any kind of vehicle. But we took the risk. I got the board's backing. It was not always easy. I met a board member later, uh, Mr. Vagol of ICICI, of all of you know, and said, Anand, you didn't know it, but we had decided as a board that if this project failed, you were going to lose your job. Now, I'm glad I didn't know that. Otherwise, I might have probably stuck to my comfort zone. But we... We persevered, and I remember that when we first showed the project to the chairman of Ford Motor, and Ford was a partner of ours at that time, and I showed them the clay model of this in London, and Alex Trotman, the chairman, was there along with the vice chairman, Wayne Booker, and Wayne got very excited, and he said, you know, we're going to give you 40 engineers to help you make this. And I remember Alex turning around to him and saying, Wayne, let's not do that. Because if we give them those 40 Ford engineers, this thing's going to turn out looking like, smelling like, costing as much as a Ford vehicle. But if these guys do this for $120 million, we better be asking their engineers to come out and tell us how they did it. So the <laughs> and the rest is the best thing he did for us was to deny us those 40 engineers. And denial-driven innovation sometimes is the most successful. I couldn't, of course, resist showing this picture, which is familiar to most people here, because uh, the best endorsement we ever received, of course, was from uh, Chief Minister Modi, who then, this is a picture of him going for his swearing-in, where, unfortunately, he got out, and after sworn, being sworn in, he moved into a BMW. Um, so I'm st one of my projects still is to go back to him and try to get him to come back to his beloved chariot of old. What are we doing now? You said, Anand, that's 2002. That's a long time ago. So we are taking some more risks. And I suspect my job may be on the line again. This is the Batista. It's a car designed by Pinin Farina, which is one of the world's most renowned design and styling firms, which was in financial trouble, so Mahindra acquired it. And I remember telling the, the family member, Paolo Pininfarina, that if you let us buy your company, we will fulfill your grandfather's dream, which was to make a car that bore his name and not just design cars for Ferrari and the others. That's one of the reasons we got the deal. We have designed this car. It is going to be not an inexpensive car. It's $2 million a car. We're only going to make about 100 of them. We introduced it a year ago, the concept, but the fully drivable vehicle will be visible this year in Pebble Beach, California. It goes from zero to 100 in two seconds. It's fully electric. It has a range of 450 kilometers, electric 
range and top speed is 375 kilometers. Why is an Indian company doing this? Because we want to move out of our comfort zone. And we know, we are not stupid, we want to take calculated risks. We know that we could not sell a $2 million car branded Mahindra. So we bought a brand that could conceivably sell this car, but we applied our Indian frugal mindset because this car is going to be developed at a fraction of the cost that other companies have been trying to develop such cars. They've spent billions of dollars and we will spend, we'll be spending considerably less. So I'm not here to advertise this. As I said, I might lose my job over this, but I just wanted to tell you that I wasn't here to just give, listen, to give speeches and sermons without actually walking the talk. So um, this is what really is my, my sort of slogan today, that we need to move from going to target the lowest cost per unit of output. That has been the kind of uh, mantra, if you will, of all emerging market countries. Um, they come in and they say, we are going to be the inheritors of the new lowest cost capabilities. I don't think we have to target simply being lowest cost per unit of output. Those days are over in any case. What we have to do is target the lowest cost per unit of innovation. So we have to use that old skill we have, that entrepreneurial urge. We have to use it, however, to build high quality, to build it at a very frugal cost. But it must be innovative. It must be disruptive. And it must disrupt the world. And it should be at scale. If we can do that, that, I think, is the direction that India needs to take. So effectively, we have to move from Jugaad to Jakas. If we can do that, then we seriously will inherit the world. So I, I just wanted to share a little clip from a film called Sui Dhaga, which some of you may have seen, because I think all of this is about um, self-belief, really. And I thought this was a very charming film, which showed uh, the kind of leap you can make if you have self-belief. It's a plot of a film. But effectively, these were people who were lower middle class people who got fed up of working for somebody else. So they bought a sewing machine, decided to create a fashion house of their own, went through a, a lot of trials and tribulations, and ultimately appeared in front of a panel that was going to fund fashion designers. And as you know, it has to have a happy ending, any, any Bollywood film does. And so they did actually win the award. And they were effectively selling their designs all around the world. Now that's a kind of gumption, that's the kind of courage you need. Because that will take us from the pictures we saw, the Khatiya waiters and so on, the, the shoemaker. When they, when they get out of their comfort zone, when they take risks, that is when you'll get that kind of outcome. That's the Sui Dhaga message really. And I think the Prime Minister himself is very keen on seeing that we encourage startups and move to self-employment. But effectively, it's about moving from the impossible to the unstoppable. But I just wanted to share it with you. Why is it that I believe so much in this vision of Jhakas? Am I simply playing to the gallery? This audience would love to hear stories about how India should aim high and be ambitious. But I want to share with you a personal story. Um, it's an experience that I had, and I hope it will explain why I believe so much in the indigenous power, in our native power of innovation. I have two daughters. The younger one is now 33 years old. Um, she's the mother of my grandson. Um, when she was one year old, she was playing with a small glass bottle, a homeopathic bottle, and she fell and the glass broke and severed a tendon in one of her fingers. We discovered that a severed tendon is a very serious matter. It might lead to immobility of the finger. We needed to get surgery quickly. So what did we do? We went to London. We went to Harley Street and asked for the best surgeon in the world. The surgeon said, fine, I have to keep it immobilized after I repair the tendon, it'll take a month. So we sat in London for a month, waited with bated breath to have the cast come out of this one-year-old. 
When the cast came out, much to our dismay, my daughter's finger still wasn't moving. And the doctor had no clue. He said, oh, I'm sorry, it didn't work. And he said, you know, the problem is that even when you join the tendon, it's not the surgery that is, that is difficult. It's really the scar tissue that builds up during the healing. But if you get too much scar tissue, then it gets immobilized again. And he didn't have an answer. He really was, he was clueless. I flew from London to Paris because I was told there was Dr. Glischenstein, who was a very famous surgeon in Paris and knew about hand surgery. So I go to him and he's looking at me. He looks at the case and he says, why didn't you go to Dr. Joshi? I said, what? He said, Dr. Joshi. And I said, where is he? He said, he's in Mumbai. And I said, where? He said he has, a, he looked up his diary and he said he has a clinic in Worley, five minutes from my office. I go to Dr. B.B. Joshi, one of the most hum, humble people I've ever met. He said, I'll fix her. He took her into surgery. This is what he did to solve that problem. The surgery, as I said, was not the difficult part. When the surgery came out, he put a cast only up to the wrist. And as you can see in this diagram up here, he put a band, just a band, on her wrist. He took a hook, the kind of eye hook that you find on a woman's blouse, and he sewed it into her fingernail. And then he put an eye hook in that band. He took a simple rubber band, and he just put a rubber band between the finger and that band. What was his goal? His goal was to provide just enough flex so that the finger would heal, but there would be gentle movement enough not to allow scar tissue to immobilize it again. My daughter's 33, she plays the piano with that hand today. That's Dr. Joshi. <laughs> this man passed away some years ago. His daughter called me up, unheralded, no hero. I don't even think he got any Padma award, but he was world famous. And his daughter asked me, can I publish his monographs? And I, I said, it's the least I can do. I published his monographs. But he's died unsung. And think of what we could have done if we had backed him with a better lab, with better equipment, asked him to do more in terms of his innovation. So that's just what I wanted to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, is that I have a very, very strong belief that the best innovation lies in our own backyard. And all I want to request you today is that we need to make, in my opinion, it a national goal to support our innovators, our brave innovators, in our journey from Jugad to Jhakas. Thank you very much.